Jai Radham Madhava Kunjabihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Jaya Jaya Gopi Janna Vallabha Kirivarat Tahani Jaya Gopi Jaya Gopi Janna Vallabha Jaya Gopi Tahani Jaya Gopi Gopi Jana Valava Yasodanandana Braja Jana Hanjanaya Yasodanandana Praja Jana Hanjanaya Jammun Tira Van Chahiyam Jammun Tira Van Chahiyam Jaya Radha Madhavam Kunja Vihadira Jaya Gopi Janavallavam Giri Varadhadira Gopi Yasodanandana Braja Jana Hanjanai Yasodanandana Braja Jana Hanjanai Yasodanandana Braja Jana Chahiyam Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Om Namo Varte tat maiva shatruvat. Chant. Bandhur, friend, Atma, the mind, Atmana, the living entity, Tasya, of him, Yena, by whom, Atma, the mind, Eva, 
Certainly. Atmana. By the living entity. Jita. Conquered. Anatmana. Of one who has failed to control the mind. Two. But. Sratruve. Because of enmity. Varteta. Remains. Atma Eva, the very mind, Shratuvat, as an enemy. Translation One who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. One who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. Hmm. Purport The purpose of practicing Eightfold Yoga is to control the mind in order to make it a friend in discharging the human mission. Unless the mind is controlled, the practice of yoga for show is simply a waste of time. One who cannot control his mind lives always with his greatest enemy, and thus his life and his mission are spoiled. The constitutional position of the living entity is carry out the orders of the superior. As long as the one, one's mind remains an unconquered enemy, one has to serve the dictations of lust, anger, greed, illusion, etc. When the mind is conquered, one voluntarily agrees to abide by the dictation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is situated in everyone's heart as Paramatma. Real yoga practice entails meeting the Paramatma within the heart and then following his dictation. For one who takes to Krishna conscious directly, perfect surrender to the dictation of the Lord automatically follows. Umagyan timirandasya ginajana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurvenu maha maum vishnu padai krishna basai bhutale shimakti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pracharine Nirvishesa Sunyavadhi Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakopa Trubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pavacha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Maishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So yesterday we spoke a little bit about the importance of controlling the mind and using the mind in the right way. This verse continues with the same point. But uh, we want to speak a little bit about the mind in general because it's such a complex, and to know how it works means to be able to see it, and then when you, once you can see your mind and how it's working, it becomes easier to control it and ultimately direct it in the right direction. Uh, generally, everyone is controlled by the mind, and therefore the mind is the what we say, commander-in-chief. It makes the living entity go wherever the mind goes. <laughs> and therefore, the, the mind dictates to the living entity everything. And this one is led around by the, by the mind. And one is thinking, mistakenly, at least the conditioned soul is thinking that, you know, I'm thinking like this, I'm doing like this and that. But actually, the mind is doing it. And the mind is connected to the modes of material nature according to its nature. When the mind is in a selfless position, it's connected to the mode of goodness. When the mind's in a selfish position, it's in the, connected to the mode of passion. And when the mind is in a destructive position, it's in the mode of ignorance, like that or it's being affected by the different modes it's connected to. <clears throat> so we might want to use an example to help you understand the difference between the soul and the mind because if you don't, you'll, you'll start mixing one, of, one for the other. 
Uh, we can use a nice example, and this, think about this. There's the vast, clear sky. But then again, when you look up in the sky, you see clouds. And you, sometimes you see birds. Sometimes there's planes or objects flying in the sky. And you might also see from a distance impressions upon the sky uh, of like buildings or mountains or something. Nothing, none of that touches the sky at all. All the objects within the sky do not touch the sky, but they appear to be in the sky. So in the same way, the thoughts of the mind are impressions upon the vast sky of the, the soul. The soul is the expansive consciousness which is everywhere. But the thoughts and images that the mind projects are like the different images you see within the sky. So they never, just like the mind never touches the soul, but at the same time appears to be. So in the same way, when we look up in the sky, we see objects. What they move, sometimes they're stationary. So in the same way, the mind picks up thoughts, ideas, impressions, emotions, and it imprints them upon the soul. But the soul is not touched by that, but because it identifies with the thoughts of the mind, it becomes affected by that. So therefore, it becomes entangled into the different levels of material energy. So if you can remember that, that uh, the consciousness is vast, expansive, but the mind is the impressions that come and go within the conscious uh, mind. So you're, you can, in, your thoughts go in, your thoughts go out, your thoughts sometimes don't appear. So just like one time you'll see certain objects in the sky and then the next time you look again, they're, odd, they're gone or new objects are there. So in this way, thoughts come in and out of the mind. The mind is always moving. Um, it's, it's like, um, it's amorphous. It has a tendency to move. It keeps moving, keeps moving, it keeps moving. It doesn't stop. Therefore, if the mind is not engaged, it will look for engagement in some way or other through the material energy. Even if it's... So the mind has to be connected to something at some time at every second. Even when you're sleeping, which is a different state of consciousness, this is called uh, uh, Swapna. Swapna means dream. Therefore, in the state of dreaming, your mind is also moving through different images. And you're seeing the images in the, in the dream. And, um, but who is the person who's seeing and who is that person in the dream that you see? You see yourself in the dream many times. But what is being seen is the impression of yourself and what is seeing is you, the soul. So the soul at night sees in the dream state the uh, different images that appear. And, you get, and these images are impressions of your waking reality, and your personal identification or the experiences you've had in, in the material existence. Now there's another state of consciousness, because there's three levels. There is waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Deep sleep, the mind is also working, but because it's on such a subtle level of activity, it's called the delta waves. There are different waves, there are gamma waves, there are beta waves, there's alpha waves, there's delta waves. So when it goes on to the very slowest of all the waves, that is called deep, deep sleep. And that's the most restful time when the mind actually rests, although it's still functioning but on the slower level. Meditation is also on the, on the delta level, where there is awareness, but at the same time the mind is still. That's, that's what meditation really is, is that you can still the mind down to where you, it doesn't move, but it, at the same time it's completely aware. And therefore, in that awareness, it projects certain images that you focus on, such as if you meditate on this, the lotus feet of the Lord, if you're meditating on the holy name. So these are the different um, uh, 
states of consciousness that the mind will take you in and out of, like that. Um, when you are born, all the functions of the mind are there, but you don't know how to use them. <laughs> At the very beginning stages of our life, um, the functions of the mind are already there because mind is not something that that um, develops. It is something that is already developed from our previous life, but we can't use it because of the 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 uh, awareness of existence is so low due to our small type body, and therefore we can't function. You see, you'll see some babies are more aware of other things than other babies at the same age. It's like Srila Prabhupada. He said, when I was six months old, I can still remember when I was six months old. Now this is Prabhupada. I was sit um, sitting on the lap of my auntie and she was doing the knitting, you know, making clothes with the needle like that. So he said, uh, he, when he was six months, he could, he now was an old man, he could still remember his uh, six-month-year-old baby. Of course, that's a self-realized soul has such power of the mind. So, yeah, but can we remember back that far? Can we remember even back as far as even our early childhood, some of the impressions that we had? We might be able to go by the strength of our mind. We might be able to go back pretty far. But as, a, as the age goes, and then the consciousness starts to develop more, then the use of the mind becomes more frequent, like that. And then we're using the mind at, at every moment. Although the mind is always working, we can't always remember it. So, so this is a little bit about the, the na nature of the mind. In the mind there are thoughts. The thoughts reflect desires. They ex they express they ex a re reflect experiences, and they ins reflect impressions. They ins reflect emotions. So the mind is a combination of these different uh, aspects of our existence, thoughts of experiences like that. So um, the mind is thinking, feeling, and willing. Mm, this is the basic. This is psychology 101. <laughs> that you, you think about something and then you get a feel for it. And as that feeling grows, then you either act or don't act depending on what is called the other function of the mind called kalpa, sankalpa vikalpa. Sankalpa vikalpa means to accept and vikalpa means to, to reject. So we think of something, we get a feel for it, and then uh, we either act on it or don't act on it according to our own uh, value system, you know, or even our own desires like that. So watching the thoughts of the mind means to see how to direct those thoughts in the right way, or to eliminate those thoughts and bring in the thoughts that are Krishna conscious or positive. So one of the uh, one of the ways to do that is to watch your mind. <laughs> Instead of being dragged by the mind, just sit there and just see what you, where your mind is going to go. <laughs> Sometimes it stops just to fool you, to let you know I'm not doing anything. But it does. It's always doing something. <laughs> it can't stop. There's no way. It's the mind is a series of points. He goes from one point to another point to another point to another point. And I'll give you an example how the mind works, and I'm sure you all have an experience like that. You're sitting in the temple, you're chanting japa, and then some person walks in, and you think about something about that person, and then that leads to another thought related to that person, and then something that related to that thought will take you in relationship to that thought to somewhere else. For instance, you say, oh, where well, there is that friend of mine, and then, oh, I'm so happy they came to the temple. But then again, the last time I saw them was when we were out together in Ljubljana Square, but then what we did we do, when we were there, we were actually, you know, so you're, all, you're just going from one point to another, with the, starting off with seeing this impression of a person. 
And this is how the mind moves from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another, to another. And it'll just keep going like that. So that's why we have, sometimes we have a lot of trouble chanting japa because the mind is always moving. It's always moving. Uh, samadhi means to keep the mind in, in place without movement for two minutes and 44 seconds. If you can control the mind and focus it for two minutes and 44 seconds, you have reached the beginning state of samadhi. So before then there is concentration, there is meditation, there is absorption, like that. So it's not easy to control the mind, therefore we always have to be directing the mind to something spiritual. And through that, and spiritual is not something that is, that is part of the three modes of the material energy. So the effect of spiritual, that is it, it actually gives serenity and peace and happiness to the mind. And when that happens, the mind slows down. So in spiritual life, you'll tend the tendency is that the mind will slow down. <laughs> or you'll have a better control of the activities of the mind and you'll be able to direct it easily wherever you want to direct it. So therefore we're working with some personality we call the mind. <laughs> and it's, um, it's very active. It doesn't stop for even a second. Sometimes you tell the mind, think of nothing. Just tell your mind, think of nothing. And what is it going to do? It's going to think of something. It's going to think about thinking of nothing. That's what it's going to do. It can't think of nothing, but it'll think about thinking of nothing. <laughs> so these are just some of the examples of how the mind is. In the beginning of the Shikshastika prayers in the first verse, it says, Cheto Dharpanam Marjanam. Cheta means mind, Dharpanam means mira, and Marjanam means to cleanse. So the first principle, or the first benediction for chanting the holy name, it cleanses the mirror of the mind. So again, again, well, how is the mind refer, referred to as a mirror? Interesting. So here's another aspect of the mind. It reflects inside what's outside. In other words, uh, two people, no two people see the external environment in the same way. I'm seeing the reality in the environment in one way, you're seeing it in another way. We might have, we have a similar understanding of the environment, but because we have a certain conditioned nature, we reflect that on the images that we see, and therefore we have a slightly different, or even sometimes a completely different view or experience of the external environment. That's why it says the mirror of the mind. Just like if you're angry, a lot of times you'll see, uh, you'll see people around you are, seem to be the same way. <laughs> if you're happy, everyone looks happy. <laughs> So, in other words, the mind will reflect inside what's, what's outside, inside, or I mean inside what's outside. So there is one reality which is objective. And there's so many subjective realities which are all wrong because they're subjective. <laughs> they're wrong because there are my impressions of the external environment, just like that. But you know, sometimes you see an image and you look at it from one angle, it looks like one thing. You look at it another, from another angle, it looks like completely different. There's that exercise, they have this image of this elderly lady. You look at it, it looks like an old lady, but then if you look at it from another angle, it's a young girl. <laughs> it's the same image, it depends on how you perceive the image. One way it looks like an old lady, another time it's a young, young woman. So it's from the angle of vision. So the picture doesn't change, it's just your perception of the picture that changes from like that. So our perception of this world is that I am the center and the world is out there for my enjoyment. <laughs> and that's the conditioned nature's, uh, yeah. everything around me is for my use and for my enjoyment. <laughs> that's the conditioned nature. The spiritual nature is everything belongs to the Supreme Lord because He's created everything. And it, everything is meant to be used in His service. 
and I am his servant, so my job is, or my connection with the Lord is take the objects of the external environment and learn how to use them in his service. So the, the um, materialists, they see the world as um, being, they see themselves as being the center and everything around them to be their use. Whereas the devotees see Krishna as the center and everything to be used in Krishna's service. So it's a completely different consciousness <laughs> like that. And uh, so there is one reality, and Krishna mentions that in the Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter, where after the verse Tadviri Pratipate, and in the next verse he says, when you thus learn the truth, you'll know that all living beings are in me, they are my parts and parcels and they are mine. So re real vision means to see everything as the energy of Krishna and all living entities as pure spiritual beings. That is, that is the, the pure consciousness beyond all the subjective consciousness that the different living entities will, will adopt in their interaction with the material energy. Like that. So unless we come to that consciousness, we haven't really come to Krishna consciousness yet. We see everything in relationship to Krishna and everything, Krishna is within everything, mandantarastam paramamchayantarastam. He's also in the atoms. He's, in, he's manifested everywhere throughout existence. And one can, it says that one who has purified vision sees the objects of the external world, but that they see Krishna within the object at the same time. They can see both the object and Krishna within the object. That's pure spiritual vision like that. But we can do it from a theoretical understanding that we see everything in relationship to Krishna and everything is Krishna's energy to be used in Krishna's service. And that's, that's the verse, Chaito Dharpanam Marjanam. Uh, marjanam means to clean. So the mirror is dusty. What is that dust? Lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, uh, envy, fear, so many. These are the dust particles that are covering the mirror of the mind. So the holy name is like the, the broom that cleans or the, like the rag that wipes the dust away from the mirror of the mind. And when the mirror of the mind is completely clean, the mind becomes what is called clear consciousness. Clear consciousness is the stage before Krishna consciousness. In other words, we're, we're, we're every, seeing everything as it is. The next stage is to see Krishna within everything. That is this Krishna conscious stage. So, premanja ritam bhakti vilochanena satasa daiva ridayesha vilokayanta yam shama sundar achinta guna sarupam govinda mari purusham tamaham bhajami. When the eyes are smeared with the ointment of love, then one can see Krishna everywhere. So, love is that ointment that brings what we say. Uh, Krishna vision or spiritual, pure spiritual vision. Um, when we try to love in this world, we have a limited vision of the object that we are attracted to based on our desire to enjoy. So that is not actually love, that is just a feature of our desire to enjoy, which translates into lust, like that. So he's a, these are some of the functions of the mind. Um, so, and then we can take the different categories of the mind. There's the rational mind, then the emotional mind, the waking mind, the dreaming mind, the sleep mind, um, like that. And in the Bhagavad time, it calls karmatmaka. It's another name for the mind. Karmatmaka means colored. Uh, I don't know if you had the same experience in your country, but in America many years ago, and still people do it, there was this big fad that was going around. People were wearing different colored glasses. And they were, you had green lenses, you had purple lenses, yellow lenses, red lenses. So you put them on and the environment looks the color of the lens you're looking through. 
So the mind is like that. It's called karmatmaka, colored by conditioned nature. And therefore, back to that same point, we see the world through these uh, colored lenses, which are all wrong. Like that. The mind is independent of the body, uh, and you can see that when you sleep. The body is, is laying still and the mind is moving. Sometimes we travel out of the body, and you can see that there are severe operations sometimes where people, on the operating table, um, they actually rise out of their body and can watch the operation. There are examples of that. And there was one operation where the lady, one lady, she had an operation, she traveled and watched it. And then uh, when she came back down, she chastised the doctor. She was under an anesthesia, therefore the doctor was wondering, how is she chastising me? But she, was ch she, said, she said, you did a night operation, but you're using such bad language when you were working. <laughs> he was using bad language. So he was thinking, how does she know that? Well, she had traveled outside of her body, and she was in a different part of the same room, watching the operation from a different place. I mean, I have a friend who was a devotee. He said he used to do that quite often when he was small. He could, little kids can do that even. They can, they can travel out of their body and be, and watch their body from a different place in the same room like that. So the mind can do that. The mind is so powerful, it can take, um, it can take the soul out of the body. The body still remains, but the soul and the mind are always connected. To break the to break the mind body connection is not so hard, but to break the soul mind connection is very hard. In fact, that's what it takes to get liberation when the soul has to free themselves from the conditioned mind and ultimately attain the state of pure mind. And then the soul is no longer dragged or forced by the mind in any particular direction. Am I putting you all to sleep? Am I tired or something? They say when the speaker is tired, everybody else sleeps. <laughs> is, uh, should we change the subject? Is this too boring? This is, I know it's very philosophical and it can be kind of boring. <laughs> But if you can stay away, that would really help the speaker. <laughs> I know when you when you all working hard all day and then you sit down and you relax, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm waiting for. That moment to slow down. <laughs> but it doesn't help the speaker to let one like that. And then, um, so out-of-body travel is quite, quite frequent. People have it. Not everybody has it, but people have it. I had an experience like that when I was small. So everybody can, I think maybe all of us do. Of course, we travel out of the body when we dream at night. But we can even do it in, the, in this waking realm. We can travel out. And then there's another feature called near-death experience. I don't know if you've heard of that, NDE. There's books written about that, where people actually die. They, their physical body stops, and then their mind enters into another realm of existence, and they're traveling through this realm. A lot of times, it's very all the, the realms that they travel through can be very frightening, or it can be very... Uh, pristine and enlivening and uh, so but somehow or other because they it wasn't their time to die they come back and then they remember how they traveled into these different realms and then came back I remember one person was telling me they traveled and they saw these men dressed in black and they were going down this long tunnel it was very frightening so that frightening experience causes that causes them to again re-enter their body like that. So near-death experiences are are usually mercy manifestations of the Lord to show people what is their future when they die. <laughs> because what is the fear of death? Can anybody 
say, what, why do we fear death? We don't know what will happen. Yeah, we don't know where we're going to go. You know, you're always, we always plan on where we're going to go and how we're, what we're going to do when we get there. But death tells us, you're under my control and you don't know where you're going to go. <laughs> so that's the fear of death. To die is not so bad, but the, the entering into the unknown is a, is a very frightful per, per thing. And that therefore people are, uh, you know, fearful of the unknown. And so these near-death experiences that people have, they get a little idea of what is their destination when they die. And then they come back and then they have a chance to change their life. If that so-called experience is a negative experience, they can change their life and therefore they can change their destination. Some people do that, others don't. They just go on with their same life. Um, Women who have who who uh, have difficulties at childbirth, and many of them have dear. I know. I remember. I met one lady. She had three near-death experiences. Each time she gave birth to a child, she left her body and then came back. <laughs> Later on, she wrote a book describing seven different kinds of near-death experiences, and these are all the movements of the mind. You have to understand how the mind is moving through different realms of existence based on emotions, desires, attractions, attachments. So this is all some of the workings of the mind. So then, therefore, in this verse it says, one has to conquer the mind by and make the mind the best of friends. And the best friend means one who knows your best interest. So your mind has to be, be engaged in such a way or directed in such a way that it brings you to Krishna consciousness or to the spiritual activities. So knowing how the mind works helps you to somehow or other direct it. Even, even when you're sleeping, if you have enough power, even in dreams, you can, you can overcome the destiny, destination of the dream. The dream might be pulling you in a certain way, and you can fight against that. By your, in, in other words, people who have strong minds, or what we say purified minds, they can uh, somehow or other see themselves in the dream and change the experience by waking up, usually. It's usually by waking up. <laughs> like that. So these are, so the mind is really the only friend and the only enemy. <laughs> so when it takes us to Krishna, and to purify the mind means to chant Hare Krishna. We should, well we might think, well I'm chanting Hare Krishna, my mind is still like a garbage dump, you know. <laughs> It's got, you know, still got comic books in there and still got, you know, rock and roll songs. Still got images of my girlfriend back 20 years ago. It's got so many things in there. So, but cleaning the, cleaning the, the, the consciousness is like cleaning uh, a... It's like cleaning a piece of coal. You know what coal is? You know, that's black stuff you burn. You keep cleaning and it still just keeps looking black. <laughs> so don't give up. <laughs> Even if you find yourself, you know, your mind is just like, whoa, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> what birth was that? <laughs> So don't be discouraged because, as we mentioned, there are, of course, there's three states of the mind, but there's two categories of the mind. One is consciousness and one is unconsciousness. We function about 10 to 15 percent on the conscious level. 85 percent of our mind is on the unconscious level. Example is a computer. When you turn on your computer, what's up on the screen is just one small part of the information that's there within the hard drive. There's so much. 
But you can't all you can't see that. All you can see is what's up on the screen. But you know by pushing different buttons, different images and different informations will come up on the screen. So this mind has so much on the unconscious level that we're not even aware of. Impressions, desires, experiences, uh, everything is there, emotions. And many times it'll come to the surface. It comes to the surface in dreams, it comes to the surface just, they call it deja vu, you've, you've heard of that, deja vu. Oh, an experience that you can't really connect to in this life, but actually it's coming from previous lives, like that. So there, yeah. So the whole process of uh, mind control is to realize you're dealing with a very complex monster. <laughs> He's powerful, and he'll come, and you don't know what's in there, but you want to get rid of some of it and replace it with with spiritual thoughts, spiritual impressions, spiritual desires. And that's the process of Krishna consciousness. This why the process usually is a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that happens after some time. So just keep working, but keep watching your mind and don't let your mind control you. Control the mind. When the mind is bored, it says, all right, I'll go to sleep. You know. Nothing out here that interests me anyway, so I might as well just take rest. <laughs> That's a sign of boarding. Or the mind, the mind is also an organ, and our mind can get tired. It says that those who work with the mind need more sleep than those who work with the physical body. Yes. Because the mind can also make you exhausted. You see that when you push your mind sometimes on the computer or some other uh, uh, process of thinking, the mind can get tired, and does get tired. And one of the tricks of the mind is that when you try to control it, and it doesn't want to get be controlled, it shuts down and says, I'm out of here. <laughs> it just goes, and, just, and you think, what happened? It can't, I can't control it, and I can't even find it anymore. It's, it's just not functioning. So the mind is not only, it is like a little kid that is spoiled. <laughs> That's a good, good definition of a mind. Or it's like a barrel of monkeys that are all sitting in this one big room, and no monkey is doing the same thing as the other monkey. They're all jumping different ways. So that's the nature of the mind. Just like I'm talking, how many times have you actually diverted your attention to something else during this class? Count it. Sometimes you can just count it. So it's just that that's how the mind works. It's very difficult to control. But when you focus your mind on the lotus feet of the Lord, then the mind is fixed. And if you can keep that impression into your mind, then your mind will always be in the best position. And we'll speak about transcendental consciousness in one of the two upcoming classes. We have two more classes after this. Today I just wanted to give you a little bit about the workings of the mind so you know what you're dealing with. It's just, and there's much more. In substance, the mind is like ether or space. It's expansive, open, all-pervading. In movement, the mind is like the wind. It controls simultaneously inner and outer physical activity. In illumination, the mind is like fire. It has understanding. It sheds light. It can perceive. In emotion, it's like water. Feelings of empathy and emotional experiences. In weight, mind is like memory and attachments. Memory is weighty, attachments are weighty. So you can see the different categories within the mind, like that. And then there's, um, this is a little revolutionary. We say that there is the inner mind, outer mind, and intermediate mind. And this is coming more from the yoga uh, categories. Inner minds are feeling 
and intuition. You get feelings, you have intuitive, intuitive thoughts. And that, that's where spiritual life really starts to uh, begin. The outer minds are the senses, the emotions, and gathering impressions from the environment. Their intermediate mind is what come you bring inside, when we bring outside in, and then you bring inside out. So it's like a transitional part of the mind where thoughts are going in and out. It's like they call it the intermediate mind. It meditates between sensory, transcendentary, sensory impressions and emotions on one side and deep and abiding internal feelings on the other. So that, I'll read it again. The intermediate mind meditates between transcendent, trans, transient, transient sensory impressions, transient sensory impressions, and emotions on one side. So on one side, it meditates on these sensory impressions and emotions, and on the other side, deep and abiding internal feelings on the other combination of the external and internal. Reason, perception, reason and perception equals what? When you have reason and you have perception based on the reason, what is the result? I'll ask you that question. You're reasoning and then you perceive something by the reasoning, what's the, what's the conclusion? Well, action, but just what precedes action? Yeah, that's decision, right. Or we say, uh, what's the word here? Judgment. Judgment, decision, evaluation. Yeah, good. The inner mind deposits the feelings attached to the object. The intermediate mind is intelligence, and the outer mind is sense experience, sense perception, like that. Okay. Well, there's a lot here. I have got ten pages of notes here. So. We'll also speak about the austerities of the mind. And we have to practice mental austerities, otherwise we can't be able to control that mind. These the sensory, the austerities are tools for controlling the mind, <laughs> like that. And that's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. I'll list them so you get an idea of what they are. We won't discuss them tonight because we don't have the time. The austerities of the mind are satisfaction, gravity, simplicity, and self-control. Mm -hmm. These are the austerities of the mind and purification of one's existence. This is from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 17, verse number 16. Okay, so we have approximately 10 minutes or a little more. Any questions? It's one question on the internet. I have a question, if possible. Is it possible that in some point, more you chant with Japa, more you notice your mind, and more your mind is becoming like a crazy monkey? Well, what's happening is, um, this is an experience the devotees go through. That crazy monkey is that the, the chanting of the holy name is like, the fire, and the mind is like butter. So you put butter on fire, and that's how you make ghee. Slow fire. So the slow fire separates the fat from the clarified part of the butter, and then the fat comes to the, goes to two places. It goes to the top and stays on the bottom, but generally it comes to the top. So when you're chanting Hare Krishna, this is a good analogy, you're starting to bring out those 
things in your mind that are actually your attachments, your material desires, they're coming to the forefront. And what do you do with those? You let them go. In other words, you let them go, you don't look at them, you don't meditate them, just let them go. Just like a horse is running, so it's been running for a long time, but then it passes in front of you, and at the time it passes in front of you, you see it. But when it keeps going, you don't see it anymore. So these thoughts will come from the unknown, pass to the conscious awareness, and then keep let it keep going out like that. So yeah, and then there's another principle is that when you're chanting, you're trying to control the mind, or the holy name is fo fo pulling the mind towards the sound, and the mind doesn't want that. It still wants to do what it wants. So sometimes it fights, and that's, the, that's part of the craziness of the mind. It's fighting the idea of being controlled. We think, oh, when I'm not chanting, I'm I'm okay, but when I'm chanting, what happened? I'm, I'm crazy. <laughs> no, it, just like when you're, you know, when you go to the doctor, you may find yourself have a, a severe disease. And you may not even experience the effects of the disease, but when the doctor tells you, well, you do have this cancer, and therefore we need to operate. So the operation is painful. But it's part of getting rid of the disease. So that painfulness is the purification. appears to be difficult, but it's the purification that is being used to bring the mind to the state of uh, suddhasattva, pure, pure consciousness, pure goodness. Okay, you got the microphone. So, what's next? <laughs> So, Hare Krishna, in relation to this, uh, you mentioned that by chanting, uh, our nartas are coming out. They can. They can. Uh, you can also see them. Yes, mm -hmm. that, that's what I'm experiencing as well. So, then, like you know, you can ask yourself how to rectify this because this anarta, this is our false ego. This is. Our habits, yeah. which needs to be... That's the process of bhakti. Be, yeah. Yeah, devotional service means to get rid of these things. So devotional service is active service and purification of the mind through the process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. You have to do both. If you just hear and chant, that's nice, but doing the active service purifies, will, will bring that... Um, purification more direct because you're actually using your mind and senses in practical activity. But then you have to hear and chant also. The thing is, you have to. It's it's a two part or two 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 aspects, sadhana and seva. Because <laughs> sadhana equals seva, and seva and sadhana together equals sadhya. Sadhya means gold. What is the goal? If you just do sadhana, you get some benefit. But you won't be able to reach, because when you're doing sadhana, you're really asking for seva. And if you're just doing seva and you do to don't do sadhana, then seva can also become like work. It's sadhana that makes seva transcendental. Mm -hmm. So by doing practical seva, we are um, getting some uh, attachment, developing some uh, good qualities. Yeah. But what about those bad qualities? They're gonna bad qualities. Are, they have no substance. They're just like clouds. Just like you see a cloud, but when, when, when the wind comes, the cloud blows away. Or when the sun comes out, the, the sun destroys the clouds. Yeah. yeah. These bad qualities are not real. 
good qualities are real. Bad qualities is simply a covering over the good qualities, that's all. Just like, what is darkness? The remaining of the light. The what? The, the remaining of the the absence of the light. Absence of the light, right. So darkness has no substance. It's just the absence of light. So these bad qualities have no substance. They're just the absence of good qualities. And so. Same with cold. What is cold? Cold is simply the absence of heat. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? I had one question more. If you have time, I'll work tomorrow. Yeah, the, we consider the end of the class when the curtain closes. Ah, okay. So, a little bit different. Like, I was thinking when you were mentioning dreaming. Like, sometimes we can have dreaming. Like, there is also in some purpose that by dreaming, sometimes we can fulfill through dreaming some karmic desires. So we don't need to leave it. This is one perspective. And sometimes the dreams are blurred. Sometimes the dreams, you can get even some realizations. I got some realizations which helped me yeah. to change. So then the question would be, either there are one source or more sources of dreams, and what is the goal, the meaning? <laughs> this <is> the, <laughs> if you, dreams have a few complex meanings behind it. It's not just one way. Could be just impressions thrown together from the waking reality, and now they're reappearing in the dream state. It could be that you, as you say, you have certain desires, and then you you you're not fulfilling those desires on the on the waking stage. Jai Panchatattva Ki Jai. You're not filling you're not fulfilling those desires on the waking stage, but because the desires are strong. You fulfill them in the dream. Hmm. That's one way. And, I, and yeah, so dreams are not just one way. You can't just say, well, dream is like this. It could be a different things that inspire dreams. Like, you know. But where they're coming from? From Paramatma approved, approves the... They're coming from the unconscious mind due to impressions and desires. And so. Just like impression, like you mentioned the other yeah. day. Yeah, impressions, desires, experiences. Like artificially. Uh, some of it actually simply reflects our desires, and other words, it just makes no sense at all. Yeah, Prabhupada gives the example in the Krishna book. He says, you see a mountain, and you see gold. So in the dream you see a golden mountain. Because you have impressions of both gold and mountain, the dream throws it together into a golden mountain. So it really has no meaning. But then there's other dreams that are just simply unfulfilled desires on the, on the waking level. And so we're fulfilling them through the dream state. And where are those dreams are coming from? Well, of course, other things, too. People can also transfer their negative thoughts to you through association with you. Just like it says you shouldn't eat uh, grains cooked by non-devotees because then you'll start to dream a little bit. You'll get their karmic consciousness through your dreams. So you might get some crazy dream based on your eating food cooked by non-devotees. That's Prabhupada very strongly uh, admonishes us. Do not take food cooked by the non-devotees because you pick up their karma. You can also have these crazy dreams like that. Or another thing, sometimes you have a very strong impression on the waking level and it stays with you and it reappears again on the dream state. <laughs> Like every time I, I dream every night because every because mother uh, mother uh, Somadatri cooks for me, but I always dream about devotees. 
I'm thinking, this is pretty good, but I hope it doesn't change, you know. <laughs> so based on my cook, I get kind of, I get dreams one way or the other, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I get no dreams, and that's the best state, but... <laughs> Yeah, just like the one, one of our spiritual masters. He was he was eating one, he was eating some cooking by one of his disciples, and then he said afterwards, he said it was one. It wasn't a dream, but he was just experiencing it on the waking level. He said, "Are you listening to Beatles songs?" And she said, "Guru Maharaj, how did you know?" <laughs> Well, and, you know, it's, it's in her consciousness, and when she's cooking, he's eating, and then it comes into his consciousness. And then and I can't get, you know, and then there's the Beatles song is playing. <laughs> so, yeah, the mind can pick up. And so, therefore, association is very, very important. Be careful of how, who you associate with and how you associate with them. Because their mental impressions and their desires can also be affect you in one way or the other. That's why we should always keep association with devotees. Okay? Yes. So you said that the dreams are like a product of our impressions. But what, um, what about in the case of such elevated souls as Srila Prabhupada when he dreamt of his Guru Maharaj that he has well, to that's spiritual. Else? Prabhupada says if you dream of something spiritual, that is that's Krishna conscious. <laughs> hmm? It can, or it can come by the strength of your own spiritual. It comes by your own spiritual strength. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, if you dream about Prabhupada, you dream about Krishna. There, that's as good as your activities on the waking level. But then again, there's also a, a trick dream. There's sometimes there are personalities who appear in your mind and take images of the, of God or the spiritual master and trick you. That can happen too. And how do you know what is the real dream and how, what is the false dream? Is the activities of the person and the dream is the same. If there's an activity different in the dream than that, what that person would, would normally does, then you know it's not. Yeah, there was one, one devotee was telling me, oh, I'm dreaming of Prabhupada, and I'm sitting with Prabhupada, and I put my head on Prabhupada's lap, and he strokes my head, and I so feel so... I said, that's not Prabhupada. She said, no, that's Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada doesn't do that. <laughs> so she was persistent. Then finally she came to me, she said, you're right. In the dream, Prabhupada again came and he started becoming angry and started smashing everything. <laughs> so uh, then I realized it was a ghost. <laughs> so that's how you tell what is an actual spiritual dream. It doesn't, not, the understanding doesn't change in the dream state from what is on the, on the reality, on the, on the waking state. Mine's tricky. <laughs> but you can tell by the, by the nature of the dream whether it's some ghost imitating or it's actually, you know, Prabhupada or Krishna or some spiritual personality appearing in your mind. Yeah. So, okay, I'm sorry if I interfered with your mental process here for an hour, anyway. <laughs> I hope we can have some nice dreams tonight. <laughs> Dream about Krishna. It says the residents of Vrindavan, they work hard all day serving Krishna, and at night that's all they do is dream 
about Krishna. There are devotees, many devotees who have, they, they dream spiritual things every night. Or when they're dreaming, it's always like that. And there's others, we, some of their dream states are rated X. <laughs> you don't want to talk about some of those. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> so what, be careful. What you do on the waking level will affect what happens on the dreaming state. <clears throat> Always keep good association and never eat food cooked by non-devotees, even if it's parents or others. Okay. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.